And I think we're live. Oh. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll mute these videos. Okay. Uh, can everybody hear us? As you know, can you, is there any way to check? <laughs> so, uh, so Julien says hello. So I guess you can probably hear this. Christoph says uh, loud and clear. So that sounds good. Okay, it works. Oh, hi, Anna. Okay. Uh, how about Oriota? Can you, can you say something to check? Um, yeah, um, what? <laughs> Can you hear me? Good. <laughs> yeah, there is a bit of latency, of course. We made this uh, so that the quality is slightly better. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, this seems to work. So, yeah, maybe let's start. Oh, it's, it's seven. All right, so uh, welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us uh, already quite a number of uh, on-time people very nice um so most of you are probably from home and we're glad that we are here to uh to give you a free uh, entertainment on friday night um so opening the weekend with science uh so this um uh, this event is organized by cross labs um so it's a, a bit more than one year old research uh, institute now so we focus on uh, uh, intelligent sciences and uh, new uh, crazy technologies uh, that uh, uh, kind of uh, yeah, innovate uh, both on the academic side and in the, on the AI industry. Um, so our mission is to distill knowledge from, uh, let's say, disciplines of mind, brain science, mathematics, uh, information dynamics, uh, AI, neural nets, etc. cetera. And, um, and we are interested in uh, all of that but also the technological side. So and this event uh, is called Crossroads um, after the company that funds us uh, and, and funded uh, and founded uh, Cross Labs as well. So Crossroads is monthly, more or less. Uh, we try to uh, at least provide one event a month. And uh, it's about sciences of mind and intelligence. And uh, the idea is uh, to have uh, uh, super cool speakers uh, share with us uh, their uh, new results and new ideas about uh, AI and intelligence. Uh, so this event is organized by uh, Antoine, myself, uh, Katza, um, the CEO of our company, Cross Compass. And uh, yeah, special thanks to uh, Stephen and Yasmin, as always, uh, helping out organizing this. And uh, a little word about Cross Compass. It's a tech company uh, focusing on AI uh, in Tokyo. And um, yeah, they do AI in manufacturing, robotics, uh, vision, IoT, uh, and whatnot. Um, so, um, yeah, many of you uh, present are maybe uh, working there or have heard about it. Um, thank you for joining. Okay, so tonight uh, we are uh, welcoming uh, Ryota. Good night, Ryota. Uh, uh, Ryota Kanai is a neuroscientist uh, working on uh, the science of consciousness. Um, and he graduated from uh, Kyoto University, then went to Utrecht, get ready. So in the Netherlands, uh, he also went to uh, Caltech after getting his PhD, UCL, uh, Sussex, where he had the lab. Um, and uh, then he came back to Japan and founded uh, Araya, which is uh, another AI company. And uh, they do also consciousness research, uh, very interesting stuff. He became also uh, a professor at Sussex before moving back here. And, uh, and he started a business um, that is not only doing, you know, applications of AI, but also uh, trying to bridge the gap between um, the AI science and the consciousness science, which was his specialty. Um, all right, so uh, actually our companies are now collaborating. I'm, I don't know if I'm allowed to say more, so I won't. But uh, <laughs> tonight, uh, for the first part, uh, Ryota is going to give um, a talk, and then we'll have, as always, a chance to discuss. I will post a link that you already see. I will post it again for Slido, and you can uh, ask questions directly um, through that, that interface. It's just, you go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and then you search for uh, hashtag crossroads in one word. Okay, so without further ado, Lyota, the floor is yours. 
Okay, yeah, yeah, thank you, Olaf. Um, yeah, it's uh, very nice to have this opportunity to give a talk in this series. Um, so, yeah, there's something I want to like, comment on or no, as a chat. Um, so, so, this series um, has been inviting a lot of interesting speakers before. And also, like something like three weeks ago, I gave a talk uh, in a series called Mathematical Consciousness Science. And also, uh, we as a company, Araya, uh, organizes uh, an, a series of events called Consciousness Club. So I, th I think like all these sort of like interdisciplinary like, talk series uh, you know, with some relevance to consciousness uh, are getting like very popular or common. And I, I think this is like a really interesting format and, and uh, because of the COVID, uh, now it's getting like really common to give talks online like this. And the, the interesting thing uh, for me is that uh, now we have more international communication. So that like, we used to have these events uh, locally in Tokyo and uh, they created like really interesting uh, sort of the like, community and and no, that was a value, but, but at the same time, I, I think uh, like this series uh, uh, give uh, like oh, scientists based in Japan to uh, show their work internationally. So that's a like, really interesting aspect. And uh, another thing is, uh, I, I feel these days the role of conferences may be changing a little bit. Like no, now a lot of uh, like, you know, big conferences are uh, going online, and but at the same time, I feel maybe it's not so important to sort of do all the talks uh, within a short period of time. But instead, we seem to have like a lot of ongoing discussion. So, like you know, maybe some people give a talk uh, in this kind of format, and then we can discuss that. So, for example, in the previous. Uh, talk I gave in uh, mathematical consciousness science. Actually, after the talk, a lot of people contacted me, and actually, uh, you know, some of them resulted in new collaborations. So, so I, so I really like this format now. And okay, so so this is uh, just a kind of a random chat, but but so today I want to talk about consciousness and intelligence. So let's move on to my slide, okay, I hope it's working. Let me go to full screen, right. So um, yeah, so, so uh, in this talk, I want to somehow connect consciousness with intelligence or like functions. And, but, uh, but since, um, no, I, my aim is to have more discussion. So, so in the first uh, 30 minutes or so, I want to give you a, sort of like a, a general introduction and also like some materials uh, which we can discuss later. Okay, so let's start. Okay, so first I want to start with uh, five problems, problems of consciousness. And so there may be more, more problems, but I just want to uh, highlight uh, some of the key problems. And uh, the first problem uh, is the uh, you know, famous one called the hard problem. So, so this question is about how and why uh, conscious experiences, subjective experiences, uh, so emerge from electrochemical interactions happening inside the brain. So, so you know, when, when we think about visual perception, uh, like, you know, visual information uh, comes uh, from the eyes and and then the light hits the retina and then that uh, the light is converted to uh, electrochemical signals and then those signals uh, reach the brain and then uh, there are a lot of additional uh, processing happening but, but then somehow uh, uh, these uh, physical interactions give rise to uh, conscious experience. The, the mystery of the hard problem is, uh, you know, it seems uh, from our current understanding of physics, like all we have to describe is now uh, these physical interactions. 
But uh, from subjective viewpoint, we have so this like a, like a clear sensation when we see something that we have that experience. But 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 then uh, it seems like extremely difficult to explain uh, how those experiences uh, occur, like uh, in terms of so, some sort of like, uh, mechanical uh, interactions uh, of uh, neural signals. So that's a hard problem. And you know, I, I think it, you know, it is true. This is a hard, uh, like a really hard, hard problem. But 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 at the same time, I feel like we paid too much attention to this problem. Of course, you know this this uh, problem makes consciousness an interesting topic to study. But uh, but, but but I feel uh, you know, in this viewpoint, it seems the conscious experience happen as an epiphenomenon. So it doesn't have any like, causal impact uh, to what we actually do. So like, you know, everything uh, is physical and then well, there's uh, nothing left. So, so I, I think this problem also starts from a uh, like, particular way of uh, conceiving the physical world. And, but the second problem, uh, which I call the boundary problem is more potentially realistic problem. So the, the question is, uh, what determines the boundary of consciousness? So we, you know, we kind of know that consciousness happens in the brain, but uh, but we all have individual consciousness. So like, you know, my consciousness is not connected to your consciousness. So like you know, between brains, there's a boundary. So there's some sort of like, like individuation. But of course, you know, we can think uh, think and talk about. Uh, the consciousness of society or uh, of a country and so on, but, uh, but, but but from our sort of personal perspective, the consciousness that we know is individuated, and but at the same time, uh, not the whole brain uh, directly contributes to consciousness. So yeah, so uh, there have been a lot of neurophysiological neuroimaging studies that try to. Uh, pin down uh, where in the brain information corresponds to the contents of consciousness. And uh, this, this is a like, ongoing like, um, sort of research, but, but at least we know not, not all the brain is conscious. So, so then the question is like, like why particular parts of the brain contribute to consciousness while other uh, so neural activities outside those regions uh, do not directly contribute to consciousness. So, so we need to uh, have an explanation for this. So that's a boundary problem. And, and I, I think well, probably you know, this seems much more tractable compared to the hard problem. And the third problem is a scale problem. So, so this is kind of similar to the second problem, but, uh, but here the question is, uh, uh, the scale, the like spatial temporal scale. So when we think about the brain, the brain has a kind of a hierarchical structure you know, in, in scale. So, so of course we have neurons, but, but, uh, but in, inside uh, uh, neurons, there are a lot of like subcellular stuff, but, uh, but probably we are not directly conscious of the activities of individual neurons. Um, like like you know, in, in physiology, uh, when uh, scientists record from uh, in individual neurons, they, they seem to be firing randomly, but, but we don't have, uh, experience those single spikes. And yeah, but, but instead, uh, it's just common to think information is somehow represented as a population of neurons. So that seems to be like more uh, you know, directly uh, relevant for the contents of consciousness. And, but but the whole brain is probably not conscious, and but and as I mentioned, maybe a society a multi agent interaction uh, is not conscious. So there seems to be the kind of right level of consciousness, uh, right uh, scale, uh, where like the information content corresponds to conscious content. But but we don't know. Uh, so empirically, we don't know. Uh, no, what scale corresponds to consciousness. And also, now, if, if we identify such a scale, we, you know, we want to be able to explain why uh, that scale is uh, specifically important. 
and the fourth problem is a function of consciousness. So, so you know, as, as I said in the beginning, uh, you know, here I want to connect uh, consciousness with intelligence. And so the question is, uh, you know, so uh, as written here, you know, what is a function of consciousness? And also, uh, you know, when we consider evolution, uh, consciousness must have um, emerged at some stage in evolution, but, but we don't know when and also why. So what, what's the benefit of having consciousness as an organism? So that's a, an open question. But, but, but I think, no, I kind of criticize the hard problem because uh, it seems to be kind of based on kind of particular viewpoint about the, no, the physical world and consciousness. But, uh, but, but I think, uh, no, no, we have been too fascinated by uh, the hard problem and I forgot to ask uh, the question about the function of consciousness. And the fifth question is, uh, how can we prove consciousness? So, you know, for example, uh, there are already a lot of theories uh, about consciousness, but, but not so many theories can actually make predictions about whether AI or aliens uh, have consciousness or, or, or what kind of, you know, there, there are not so many theories that can actually make predictions about whether they are experiencing something visual or something auditory. So, so they, are, they are open questions. Uh, in my opinion, uh, integrated information theory uh, uh, seems to be able to address uh, the, uh, these questions, but, uh, but other theories are more, uh, not so uh, uh, principled, uh, or they're not necessarily a physical uh, Theory. So, uh, so in that sense, uh, I, I'm not so satisfied uh, with the current situation of uh, theories of consciousness. Yeah, but, but we can uh, make yeah, a lot of improvement. Okay, so, so from here, um, I want to talk about uh, uh, how consciousness is related to uh, general intelligence. And uh, of course, you know, it's a Big topic, and I, I don't claim I solve all, all, all of this, but but I, but here I want to uh, give you uh, some introduction to this topic so that we can discuss this later. Okay, so so this is the motivation behind thinking about the relationship between consciousness and intelligence. So uh, I, I start from a very naive uh, intuition. Um, so here's the question uh, I wrote is, so now when we watch uh, like science fiction movies um, about AI, uh, you know, AI somehow becomes conscious uh, by increasing uh, their like intelligence level. And yeah, so there seems to be like, you know, you know like in, in those science fictions, uh, people seem to have some like naive intuition that there's some sort of critical point where like intelligence converts to consciousness. And but, but I think for like professional scientists, uh, that we want to distinguish consciousness and intelligence. And clearly they are different. So, so consciousness is all about like feeling uh, or subjective experience, whereas uh, you know, like a lot of it, like AI technologies uh, can already implement some form of intelligence. I don't know, maybe you know, some people disagree, they're not intelligent. Uh, yeah, so you know, some people think they may not be intelligent, but um, yeah, but, but conceptually, it's uh, relatively straightforward to distinguish consciousness and intelligence. But, but here I want to uh, sort of, um, you know, like doubt that possibility, or you know, I'm, I'm kind of speculating that they may have something in common. And so, but, but on the other hand, as I uh, mentioned uh, in, uh, when I introduced the heart problem, I think uh, like especially scientists feel that the conscious experiences are uh, 
kind of epiphenomenon. And, and then uh, conscious experience uh, plays no role uh, uh, in terms of uh, functions. So, yeah, and, and I think this is a very difficult viewpoint to uh, escape from. But, uh, but, but uh, from my analysis, I, I think people confuse two questions. So the first one is a uh, first kind of question is you know whether subjective experience of qualia play any function. So so that's the you know subjective aspect. And and if we think if we ask this this question, you know, probably the obvious answer is uh, probably qualia do not play any function. So therefore, uh, we don't need to think about functions of consciousness. I, I, at least, you know, in my mind, uh, like, you know, this kind of uh, thinking was dominant. So therefore, I, I always felt you know, probably intelligence has nothing to do with consciousness. But, but, but I think maybe more like relevant question is a second one. So, so here, the second question is, what does consciousness enable an agent to do? So, so this is uh, about, um, so, it's, uh, it's not asking about the role of the subjective experience, right? but it's about uh, kind of like functional consequences of uh, sort of perceiving something uh, consciously. So, uh, so in like many uh, psychophysical experiments, uh, uh, there uh, we can present images some sort of unconsciously uh, and then unconsciously, you know, maybe you know, a, a simple way to do it is to present an image and then present another image as a mask. And then you know, with the effect called backward masking, the first image uh, is sometimes not uh, perceived. But, but even in such cases, the brain is activated and we know uh, the brain processes some features of the first uh, invisible image. And yeah, so 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 inside the brain, like some information reaches consciousness, uh, some information has not. And but but then the question is, you know, what kind of functional benefit we gain by becoming conscious of some stimulus? So so that's the uh, second question. So so these two questions should be distinguished when we ask functions of consciousness. And I also learned that, uh, this que uh, the second question corresponds to something called the hard question uh, coined by Daniel Dennett. So and I, I read uh, what uh, Dennett wrote and uh, it's very interesting and yeah. Okay, so, and then before I go into uh, details, uh, as I want to claim, uh, I want to make my uh, main claim here. So here my speculation or hypothesis is consciousness works as a platform for general intelligence. And yeah. Okay, let me explain more later. Okay, so, um, and, but also intelligence is a very elusive concept, uh, just like consciousness. But so, so first I want to define general intelligence. So, so this is my take. So here, uh, so generality of intelligence is measured as the ability to efficiently solve multiple tasks, including tasks novel to the agent using knowledge and models learned through past experiences. So, so I, I chose this definition uh, because, uh, okay, so, so the first point is, uh, so, so this definition uh, implies basically an equating uh, generality of intelligence with the efficiency of transfer learning or meta learning. So, 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 th so these are, uh, so in that sense, there's nothing uh, mysterious about general intelligence, but, but here I'm talking about transfer learning and meta learning. And the question is how we can uh, make them better. And, and then, but of course, uh, maybe some people are not satisfied with this definition because when we think about intelligence, uh, we seem to have language or 
you know, you know, we can use like simple manipulations. Uh, those things uh, seem to be important, but but uh, so so in that sense, I might be ignoring something. But but at least you know, to make the definition better, we need we also need to define uh, like uh, simple manipulations and things like that uh, more clearly. And then also we need to uh, be able to state the benefit of uh, such broad uh, operations. And and the third th point is uh, so AGI uh, is sometimes uh, defined in terms of human level intelligence. So you know, in a way, like human humans exist. So so in that sense, uh, it seems uh, it, it is a valid concept. But uh, but but if we want to evaluate whether some uh, intelligent uh, agents are human level or not, it's very difficult to quantify. So I wanted to start with something uh, more clearly defined. And and then, uh, yeah, so, so this was the definition I, I kind of gave, but, uh, but, but this other people also share the similar idea. So for example, here I uh, picked the sentence or the definition of uh, general intelligence uh, from uh, Francois Chollet and, and then, no, well, I realized like he already had uh, more or less the same idea. So, so I, I think you know, probably we can justify this definition. Yeah, so, but once we define uh, general intelligence, uh, at least uh, no, we can kind of think of how we can solve transfer learning or meta learning. And so, but, but here I want to propose uh, three uh, ways to sort of increase uh, generality of intelligence. And so I go through them uh, one by one. So but the first one is now solution by simulation, second by is solution by combination, and the third one solution by generation. And so I, I talk about these things also in relation to uh, theories of consciousness. And then uh, that way I try to connect uh, how consciousness is connected to intelligence. Okay, the first uh, one, like solution by simulation. So, so this, so basically, this is a model-based reinforcement learning or model-based like any uh, policy learning. So, so the idea is once we have a forward model or world model, uh, we can use it to internally simulate. Uh, and the interesting thing is. Uh, so as an agent, when you have like, you know, when you're given a new uh, task or new goal, uh, you can use the internal forward model to you know, find ways to reach that goal. So, so, so that, so what we still, that kind of uh, uh, sort of like mental simulation, uh, you can solve a new problem uh, uh, without trial and error, or maybe like with a small amount of trial and error. Uh, so, so that's one way to achieve generality. And uh, recently, we proposed uh, a kind of hypothesis about consciousness, which we call information generation hypothesis. So, so this idea is kind of closely related to this uh, solution by simulation concept. So, so in this hypothesis, uh, uh, this is our plan. So, the function of consciousness is to generate information using the models constructed by interactions with ember. So, so basically, you know, uh, uh, this is saying that consciousness allows us to use internal models, uh, which we learned from uh, previous experiences. And, and uh, in a way, this is also relevant for say, like sensory motor contingency kind of idea. At least you know, we need to run the forward model uh, through interactions with environment. And but once we have this, uh, we can use the model to interact with counterfactual situations. And so but here, counterfactual situation is about a potential future or uh, the past which didn't happen or something like that. And but but the important thing is well, once we have this kind of internal simulation, uh, we can uh, kind of detach ourselves from the input. So. So that's the idea, but but once we have that, you know, we can use it for like planning and so on. So that's the 
uh, that, that's in line with the idea of solution by simulation. So, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Okay. So, you know, maybe one relevant thing from the AI side is something called the world models uh, done by uh, uh, David Ha and uh, Jürgen Schmidt Huber. And so, so you can uh, sort of train uh, neural network to uh, encode the environment, and then like, internally, uh, you can also like learn the the dynamics of the this uh, latent state, and then. Uh, Oh, well, finally, there's a, some sort of like a simple uh, linear model for the policy. And you know, what's great about this work is uh, you know, once the agent learns to sort of uh, the world model, then the agent can actually learn the policy uh, uh, using this kind of internal mental simulation. So, so this is, uh, uh, you know, in my opinion, maybe a, a bit close to uh, some sort of uh, like conscious AI. And the re so now I want to also justify the idea behind uh, information generation hypothesis. So, so, for, so, you know, so I, I have been like thinking of like what kind of uh, cognitive tasks require consciousness. And so this is one of them called trace conditions. So it's, it's basically uh, you know, a version of uh, classical conditioning. So, so here uh, in this uh, original paper, the Clackman and Squire, uh, uh, they use something called library conditioning. So the idea is uh, when, you know, when you hear a beep and then the air path to the eye uh, follows. And so, so, so basically the subject uh, needs to learn this kind of temporal contingency. And when, in, in delay conditioning where this beep and air path temporary overlap with each other, then uh, regardless of whether the subject notices temporal contingency, they just learn to blink in response to the beep. And, but on the other hand, in a condition called trace conditioning, uh, there is a temporal gap between this beep and, uh, uh, and the air path. And, but here only the subject who became aware of this contingency learned to sort of associate these two stimuli. So, so it seems like you, know, you need consciousness awareness to sort of bridge this temporal gap. And another interesting work is a work on a poor magnosia patient called DF. Uh, so she had a, a brain damage to like a other occipital region in the brain. And so, so she lost the ability to sort of consciously perceive shapes. And so uh, because of the, the uh, lack of this ability, uh, she had difficulty judging uh, orientation of uh, um, slit. So, so, uh, so basically her response is a kind of random. But, uh, but if the task is to sort of post an envelope through the slanted uh, slit, then uh, she could do it, although she has no conscious awareness of the slit. So, so that's kind of interesting. But, um, but and also like you know, this kind of uh, data are used to uh, sort of like dissociate like, uh, uh, like con no, conscious uh, vision and uh, conscious vision for perception and unconscious vision for action. And but the interesting thing is when, when okay, so in this uh, posting task, uh, it, so first uh, she looks at the slit briefly, and then if the lights are turned off so that uh, she can see it, uh, see the slit for a few seconds, something like three seconds. And then if she was asked to post it, then she couldn't do it anymore. So, so it seems you need awareness or consciousness to maintain the information over Time. So, so in a way, uh, as I said, uh, once we have an internal model, we can use it to maintain or use it to sort of, uh, uh, like, you know, we can use that information generated internally uh, for performing action. So, so in that sense, uh, like this is like a really interesting case where uh, consciousness is required to 
maintain information over a temporal gap, which is kind of consistent with the uh, trace condition of the experiment. Yeah. Okay, so this is just a repetition, but um, okay, maybe I, oh, okay, I'm speaking much longer than I expected, so I need to speed up a little bit. But uh, yeah, there are several points, but maybe uh, one important one is this non reflexive behavior. So we usually associate consciousness with non reflexive behavior. So, so we can do a lot of reflex without consciousness. So, but reflex is uh, generally uh, sort of fixed input output relationship. So, uh, you, you receive an input and then you, you know you have an immediate output. So, that's a reflex and then tends to happen unconsciously. But, uh, but when you need to sort of maintain some information over time or use that information for planning, then it becomes a non reflexive behavior. And then that is achieved uh, through. Uh, internal generation of information. That's my, my interpretation. And also that's the connection between this internal information generation and uh, consciousness. So but from this very like short-term memory is kind of trivial. Yeah, and if I want to connect uh, information generation with AI and the brain, so the, uh, I want to talk a little bit about open order. So, uh, so uh, you know, in especially unsupervised uh, setting, uh, it's you know, kind of common to use auto encoder where you know you give an input like an image of a cat or you know, many 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 images, and and then uh, but then it needs to go through some bottleneck, and then it's kind of reconstructed. So so it's kind of like a data compression and information processing uh, is. Like this part, so so I think so. This part is unconscious, but uh, information generation happens in this decoder process. And uh, so here, my claim or hypothesis is like this decoding part generates consciousness. And inside the brain, there's something similar to autoencoder. So it's called predictive coding. So so in predictive coding, uh, you receive input or an image, and then. Uh, the uh, input first uh, goes up, but um, but then at each stage there's some top-down prediction which tries to cancel the input, and so but this can be also considered as some sort of autoencoder, and so by with this setting, this decoder part corresponds to this uh, kind of top-down backward uh, projections. So so here like this makes a prediction that. Uh, this uh, sort of generative process is like generation of information uh, corresponds to consciousness. And th there are like some uh, several lines of evidence that show the importance of feedback in generating consciousness. So a lot of times it's, uh, when we see a stimulus, initially we don't become conscious. So there's a lot of uh, like deep processing happening without giving rise to consciousness, but the consciousness seems to happen when the information starts propagating backwards to reconstruct the input. Okay, so this is just um, okay. So let's see, mm -hmm. okay, I, I, I have already spoken about happening, but maybe I'll just go in a little bit. Okay, the second solution uh, is a solution by combination. So, and the, the idea is uh, when you have, like, uh, let's say neural networks or models uh, that can be used to solve a particular problem, but we can solve many problems by combining uh, existing models or solutions. So that's the idea. And, and I think that this idea is, uh, Kind of related to uh, a theory called global workspace theory, uh, proposed by Bars and then also developed by Dehan and colleagues. And but but here I want to sort of modify this idea. So I want so I take global workspace as a kind of shared latent space. So okay, yeah. So the yeah in the original uh, versions of global workspace theory. 
it's uh, it's uh, so yeah. I think in terms of cognitive science, it makes a lot of sense. But uh, but if we want to implement them, uh, or if we want to sort of demonstrate functional benefit of having the global workspace, it's a little bit unclear how to do it. So 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 I kind of reinterpreted global workspace. So okay. So I just read this part. So the functional consciousness is to provide. Uh, compatibility of data across models by connecting the latent spaces of many function specific models. So I'm assuming that we have many uh, like specific neural networks, but uh, but but then you know, one, once they reach latent space, uh, usually like different models cannot communicate with each other. But uh, but that global workspace uh, works as a kind of latent space where uh, the different models can talk to each other and. And once this uh, compatibility in the latent space is established, it is possible to create new functions instantly by flexibly combining multiple models. So, so that's the idea of this solution by combination. And, and then the difference between the part that contributes to the content and consciousness and the part that does not contribute to the content and consciousness in the brain uh, is, is uh, whether they're inside or outside of this global workspace. And so, so, so in a way, like, you know, Oh, we always have this kind of vague notion of global workspace, but uh, but here I try to sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, like define it in terms of its potential function, which is the ability to uh, sort of communicate through a common uh, sort of language across uh, different uh, neural networks. So so this is my kind of uh, reinterpretation of global workspace theory. So but the idea is something like this. So, uh, uh, so when we want to achieve uh, a generality of functions, uh, so let's say like uh, each of these line or, or corresponds to some sort of neural network. And uh, so for example, one neural network might uh, convert an image into a category or word or another one uh, recognize the sound and then uh, output the corresponding animal, or 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 maybe you know there's another neural network that connects uh, English words to Japanese word, or you know, you know we can also convert this sort of category of cat to actual uh, like a, like image of the word or some other things. So, but but in some way uh, function or new function or new task uh, is, uh, can be uh, is easily done by combining existing networks. So for example, maybe we don't have a neural network trained to solve the problem that uh, converts image into speech, but, uh, but if we have an image to words network and words to speech network, then uh, you know, we can solve this new task. So it's kind of a simple idea, but, but but if we have many, many models, we can combine them to uh, solve new problems. So, so basically uh, solving a new task becomes finding the path in the graph of neural networks. Yeah, so, so no, PathNet is kind of uh, in the spirit, but I haven't seen much progress since uh, this paper was published, but, but maybe we can talk about it. And so, but this is just a description of global workspace. So as I said, uh, only some part of the brain uh, corresponds to consciousness, and then uh, uh, Stan Dehan and uh, colleagues uh, argue that uh, like from the part of networks works as a global workspace, and accessing those regions uh, is uh, crucial for a stimuli to reach consciousness. Yeah, but the idea is like really similar. So, so you know, in global workspace theory. Uh, there are like many task specific modules, but, but in some central region, uh, there's uh, communication between them. So they call it the broadcasting. So information is shared across many uh, sort of task specific modules. And then this part is uh, generally slower, uh, whereas like these task specific networks tend to perform uh, very quickly. So, so, so this is you know, one way to combine uh, like many uh, specific modules, and and then 
uh, solve a new problem. So uh, I think a lot of people have like this kind of intuition and, and also Benji's uh, consciousness prior talks about something like this. But, but on the other hand, in the literature of global workspace theory, uh, there, no, at least you know, as far as I know, there hasn't been like, enough uh, sort of implementation or argument to sort of explain how this kind of architecture establishes uh, general intelligence. But, but, but maybe you know, the, the authors may have had some ideas. Okay, so I just skip this and then uh, I have some speculation about the uh, about this, but I'll just skip this. Okay, so the finally I just want to talk a little bit about solution by generation. So okay, so first, you know, what, what is this? So the idea is uh, we can create a latent space for embedding uh, of neural networks. So so here maybe I, I I should show you some other videos. Uh, okay, maybe I'll just talk about this one. So, so these are all neural networks. So they have uh, some specific functions, but uh, but we can also construct a neural network that converts each neural network into a kind of point in a latent space. I, I call it qualia space um, for for a reason. But the idea is you no. Know, if you embed neural networks, you can talk about the relationship between different neural networks. Or if you have some something like a red detector, then red detector all must have some sort of uh, like similarity to orange or yellow uh, detectors. But, but then uh, there must be some sort of relationship between neural networks uh, specialized for detecting uh, certain features. So yeah, but 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 I think this kind of but here I call qualia space, but this is basically a meta representation of neural networks. Um, so I think that's very sort of important. Uh, okay, so in terms of consciousness, uh, when we talk about redness of red, we can talk about the redness of red uh, because we have this kind of meta representation. And, and in terms of uh, AGI or artificial general intelligence, uh, once we have like this kind of representation, we can sort of uh, have a representation about the, qu the quality of the processing. And, and then uh, if we you know, sort of pick a new point in this space, then we can you know, use it to generate a new neural network. So, so here I'm just uh, uh, showing a sort of embedding space for neural networks, but if we, had another space for like, many different tasks, then all we need to learn is a mapping between this embedding space of neural networks and the embedding space of uh, task space. So then you know, when you have encountered a new task, uh, uh, you use this kind of uh, translation between the task and your networks. And then from there, you can generate new neural networks. And then there are several uh, attempts. So, for example, this one is called uh, meta learning autoencoder. Uh, so, so this, uh, so so basically, this blue part uh, performs task specific thing. But uh, but but there, here is a kind of like latent space I talked about. And then from here, uh, you, know, you can you know, use this kind of generative meta generative model to generate weights of these. Uh, uh, layers, and so so here the task new you know so first this uh, meta recognition model receives a new task, and then the task is embedded, and then from this uh, embedded kind of latent space, uh, it generates uh, uh, sets of weights to solve the new problem. So so I, I think well this is a, a potentially a way to uh, solve many problems based on uh, the past experiences and yeah so, okay and okay so so maybe I like I explain this kind of solution by generation and uh, in a rush but uh, but I want to connect this to the, the concept of qualia 
And then usually like, you know, when we talk about qualia, we take qualia as a first order representations. But, um, but, but, but I think maybe from this consideration, it, it seems useful to consider qualia as meta representations. And so, yeah, so, so the reason is um, when we, so, so you know, there's something called higher order theory, but here uh, my, my claim is, um, so when we talk about some like uh, qualities of experiences, it's, um, it's just having the first order representation isn't sufficient. And so, so we need to be able to compare different experiences, but to make those comparisons, uh, we need to have some space where uh, those uh, first order representations are uh, embedded. But, uh, but, but whenever I hear higher order theory, I, I, I felt unsatisfied because the idea of meta representation is a bit unclear. So a cognitive neuroscientist is uh, open use uh, confidence rating as a, a signature of metacognition. But um, yeah, but, 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 but if you do like any neural networks, uh, the confidence is a very easy thing to compute. So, you know, so basically you can uh, compute confidence based on the um, like, uh, final uh, like softmax layer. You know, if you interpret uh, activation as probability. So, so it's like really straightforward. So there's nothing like really meta about it. And, and also like if I think about like you know, representation as kind of transformation of something else, then like, you know, so for example, like a, a detection of a line, maybe uh, no, it, it, it might be kind of meta representation of many small dots, but, but, but I don't know. It's a, so, so basically what I want to say is uh, the, the concept of meta representation is not very well defined, but, but I think if we think of meta representation as embedding of the process, so that we can use the process, uh, we can convert processes into objects, then uh, you know, we can talk about relationship between them. So, that, so that's the idea. Uh, maybe like well, maybe towards the end, I made a lot of confusion. Okay, so I'll, I'll just skip all this and then I just want to mention the three conclusions. So, so here uh, I kind of uh, rationally explained uh, like three possible ways to build AGI and, and try to sort of connect them with some theories or functions of consciousness. And, and also, my another motivation behind this is uh, so when we formulate a theory of consciousness, uh, it tends to be uh, kind of vague uh, or not computationally defined. But but if we consider uh, whether and how we could uh, implement those ideas, then uh, yeah, then we can kind of make those notions clearer. So that's another thing. Yeah. Mm. And the, the third po uh, point is um, there might be a stronger link between consciousness and intelligence and than previously thought, uh, because I, I think we tend to give up uh, on thinking about potential function of consciousness because we confuse those two questions I, I mentioned. So, so like, uh, we shouldn't stop thinking just by assuming that uh, conscious experiences do not have direct Sort of cause that effect on uh, physical substances, but uh, but instead we should think uh, what kind of functional benefit we gain just by uh, being conscious. So so that's my final message. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. So yeah, the, the labs will be virtual as as usual. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll, we'll yeah. get used to that. Very nice talk. Um, so uh, while you switch to the, um, the Slido, maybe you can uh, show that full screen, the Slido presentation part. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for, for the nice talk. I think that there are a few questions and uh, I think your, your view has, uh, has evolved a lot 
since we, we first met, maybe, you know, when you came back to Japan, I think, uh, five years ago or so. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, because, because um, you know, about five years ago, I, I got the grant to work on artificial consciousness, but, but, but I was also, you know, well, I'm still running a company. So, so I had to, uh, so, so basically, uh, no, I was uh, under huge pressure to think how we can make money out of consciousness or how, you know, how we can build like a really great AI you know, with inspiration from consciousness research. So, so I, I think that really pushed me. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think that there's something wrong with the the full screen mode. Is can uh, you do that again? I think we see only the middle part. Maybe you have two screens, or yeah, I have two screens, so that confuses. Maybe, yeah, maybe on um, the other screen. Okay. So so let, so so I'm trying to share Slido. Is it working? Uh, yeah, it's vertical, but it's working. Yeah, uh, okay, I can make it. Yeah, if you if you Does share it, it full screen, maybe it, it works full screen now. Uh, okay. But either way, yeah. Good. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, I. So let's select. Probably like a lot of people ask difficult questions. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. <laughs> but you can pick the questions. Uh, you know, you are the speaker, so you can pick the questions you you want to answer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's let me start with the first one. Uh, Matt Crosby. Okay, why focus on future predictions over present predictions? Most experiences of the present predictive coding has similar forward models for predicting present. Yes, uh, that's a very good point. So uh, like in the first part of uh, uh, information generation hypothesis, uh, there's a kind of mystery. Right? So like when we uh, want to explain the conscious experience, it's about the present. But, but here I'm emphasizing uh, past and future. So, but, but then how, how do we explain the present experiences? And so my uh, speculation about this is actually what we are experiencing you know, at, at present uh, is also a generated uh, content, but, but, the, but the generation is more detailed because you know, we, we have help from the bottom-up input. So, so you know, if we have to generate completely all the details uh, with top-down, uh, we yeah, it, it's 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 uh, pretty difficult. Uh, it's but um, yeah, yeah. So so in my view, but, this is but, basically but uh, is the same thing. principle should also apply to the the experience of the present. So it's yeah. So so the, the what we experience is actually the prediction, but of the current state, and then that content is uh, also internally generated. Okay, so second Good. one, yeah, yeah. Hmm. How, how does it work? One easy one is the, so. Could you share your slides? I guess we can. Yeah, yeah, we can. yeah. We can. We can. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Good. Uh, okay. Yeah. That's an easy one. So if we consider, yeah, if we consider all reality as virtual, don't the five problems essentially disappear? This would be in line with contemplative traditions. Mm. Ah, this is difficult. So if it comes all reality, yeah. But I think in a way, all reality is virtual. Um, it is, well, at least you know, all the reality we experience is virtual. You know, in the sense that colors don't exist and so on. Uh, uh, OK, um, I don't have an answer to this, but um, yeah, because now this requires a sort of discussion on contemplative traditions, but, but I'm not familiar enough to discuss this. Okay, sorry about this. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a that's an interesting question, but you, you're invited to, to join us to discuss afterwards in a, we'll have mm -hmm. a, a phase three, like which is informal mm -hmm. chat. And you can already join, by the way, on, uh, on Zoom, if you like. Uh, don't forget to mute yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Okay, so doesn't consciousness allow agent to distinguish self from not self? Uh, seems necessary in order to maintain homeostasis. Okay, okay. 
yes, uh, about the first part. Um, um, I, yeah, I'm not completely sure whether consciousness requires the, this kind of self other distinction, but, but from a um, sort of functional point of view, uh, it's uh, actually like self other distinction is really essential for uh, not just conscious animals, but also for building AI because uh, an agent needs to learn which part of the external world or um, the body can be sort of changed uh, according to their will. So, yeah, so so that's uh, very important, but, um, and, and I think that's, uh, that's learned through interaction with the environment. So, so in a way, internal models I talked about also has this, uh, must have this kind of knowledge and mm -hmm. Yeah, but homeo yeah, for homeostasis, uh, yeah, it's a, again an interesting topic. So I, I tend to, yeah, I also want to connect consciousness with life, and and the homeostasis is like very essential for life. And and so uh, no, may, maybe uh, the person who asked this question may be familiar with uh, Carl Preston's uh, "Life as We Know It" paper. And so the idea is. Uh, uh, like cognition has the origin in uh, in sort of uh, the like self-preserving uh, nature. So like uh, life, no, no, no self self uh, preservation is one essential feature of life, and and then to maintain life or to maintain uh, itself uh, over time, uh, it seems necessary to recognize the environment appropriately and and then act on it also to maintain homeostasis. So that seems to be the origin of cognition. But but that may be um, also performed at least uh, in like uh, primitive animals or by reflex. But so so uh, in my view there must have been some sort of like uh, a big change from uh, uh, from reflex-based uh, creatures to uh, more like sort of mental simulation kind of creatures. But um, yeah, that's my view on homeostasis. But, it, but, but it's, a, it's a big topic. Okay, let me move on to, how many more do I have? Uh, <laughs> so we, oh. we, we, do, uh, we do as many as you like. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, let, let, let's go as far as we can. Uh, <laughs> and then I pro probably okay. we'll go a bit a bit further, and then we can uh, we can yeah. start the the discussion yeah. on Zoom and yeah. then and the YouTube uh, yeah. thingy, so people yeah. can have time to transfer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it is likely that embeddings in AI models not display any qualitative properties. What is so special about metal representations in our brain? Um, um, Okay. So about the first part, mm, yeah, I, I need to uh, ask Antoine what he thinks, but um, yeah, more in detail. But but, but I think uh, it, it's like uh, entirely possible that uh, we have some like interesting like uh, manifold structure of neural networks. So for example, like you know, neural networks processing vision is very different from neural networks processing sound. Or like you know, also for like you know, shape recognition or you know, object recognition and things like that. Um, so I, I think they will be um, like nicely uh, clustered in this uh, like high dimensional space. So, but, but but I don't know. But it's still now based on distance. So uh, maybe that's uh, not sufficient. But uh, no, uh, too core qualitative. But I don't know. Yeah, I think. The structure in the distance space is, you know, I think, reasonably uh, qualitative representation. Uh, the second one, what is so special about metal representations in your brain? Um, yeah, I think this uh, this kind of meta representation I, I talked about allows us to sort of use uh, our own brain as an object. So. 
So for example, uh, let's say, you know, there's a meta representation of uh, the processing from uh, area B1 to uh, B5. And so, so then, you know, meta representation of that uh, process uh, can be uh, used when we need to solve some, uh, for example, motion perception task. So, so basically, um, yeah, the, the idea is uh, when we receive a new task, uh, we want to allocate the right part of the brain to solve the task. So, so for that kind of matching, I think this meta representation would be uh, not particularly useful. Yeah, but, uh, but yeah, so apparently this is from Antoine, so maybe we can talk more later. Yeah, so you probably join the chat right after, yeah. Uh, okay, the next one, possible outcomes of actions in the future and choose the best one to up to. Uh, that's, the, that's the second part of the, the question that yeah, okay. came, that is down here. This <laughs> one. And this is the first one. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, concerning functional consciousness, you basically say that we need it in order to simulate our environment in relationship to be able to predict possible outcomes of our actions in the future and choose the best one. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, that's a, the correct interpretation. Yeah. Good. All right. Uh, yeah. Mm. Okay. Maybe a that's couple more? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 I can go, go on. Let's assume you already developed a great machine with Consciousness. How can you prove that machine has con the consciousness? Yes, that's a that's a very difficult question. That's I, I think that's as hard as hard uh, hard problem. And yeah, so yeah, actually, I always talk about two like challenges in uh, conscious AI. So so one is how to create it. So so today I mainly focused on functions of consciousness so that I can kind of pretend that uh, we are working on artificial consciousness. But, but, but whether something is actually conscious or not requires this proof and that, that's very hard. And yeah, I have an answer to this, but, but this requires a whole uh, uh, new talk. And, but let me try to answer this briefly. So, so we need to use a theory uh, to sort of Make inferences about the contents of consciousness, uh, inferences about the presence of consciousness in machines. So the idea is, so we, we never we can never prove that uh, you know, certain machine has consciousness, but but we can construct reasonable theories. Uh, so no, so and so let's say okay. So maybe many people disagree, but. But integrated information theory turns out to be correct, or at least you know it explains a lot of conscious phenomena in humans and animals. And so, so now you know, let's say we have like a reasonable confidence about theory, and then we can apply uh, our integrated information theory to test whether machines have any file of consciousness. And yeah, so so that that's not an exact proof, but I think that's. Uh, acceptable you know, if the theory is strong and because we do that all the time when we uh, you know, make inferences about things we cannot directly observe so for example uh, you know, we cannot directly observe the core of the earth and but, 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 but based on the physics we know on the surface of the earth you know, we can make a reasonable uh, uh, estimation so in, in the same way uh, I, I think uh, we, we can address machine consciousness through a theory, but but but, but I think we are still very far from uh, like proving some theory to be like, reasonably acceptable. So so that's a challenge. But at least uh, I, you know, this is a logical step. Okay. Yeah. Let's okay. take maybe one more. Wh whichever yeah, you want. Yeah. Uh, Maybe the last one, so we can uh, we can yeah do the uh, last discussion. Okay, so okay, sorry. Let me answer this one. What makes you 
uh, consciousness important? What is the most important difference between AI with consciousness and AI without consciousness? Oh, okay, that's a good question. So yeah, so I, I think the standard idea is uh, uh, maybe consciousness doesn't add anything. Uh, or we even want to make sure that consciousness uh, or AI does not have any consciousness. But, 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 but the argument I uh, tried to create in my talk was uh, actually consciousness has been useful for establishing general intelligence. So that's my current speculation. So, so yeah, so this, this goes back to my initial motivation. So you know, in the beginning, I mentioned like in science fiction, like you know, with some, uh, no, with the increasing intelligence level, AI suddenly becomes conscious. So, so I think you know, here I, I'm thinking maybe AI researchers uh, just try to uh, make like really good like meta learning machine, and then maybe you know, without uh, them knowing, they may develop conscious AI. So that's my uh, speculation. Yes. Good. Yeah, I, I, I see that one of the questions is super upvoted. So, well, at least three of votes now. So uh, maybe let's end with that one, which is a question I also had about the overlap of solutions one, two, and three. Hmm. Is there any interesting studies about potential overlap between them? Uh, good question. Um, very hard. Okay, uh, so combination and generation are kind of similar. So actually, I, I don't think generation happens in the brain, but, but I think that kind of meta representation probably exists in the brain. But, but I, I think to solve a new problem by combining different networks, we also need to have some sort of meta representation of uh, those networks so that we can sort of manipulate them uh, efficiently. So, so the second uh, combination and generation uh, have uh, some connection. And, and for simulation, I, know, I always felt uh, it's a kind of an odd one here, but um, okay, let, me, let me see if I can kind of convey this idea. It's, I have never ex uh, explained this to anyone, or maybe explained to just one person so far. Um, okay, so what I'm thinking is we have something, uh, let's say, uh, the computational version of global workspace is just a latent space, uh, it's just vector. And all the neural networks take this like state of the global, global workspace as an input. And then the output of the neural network is also in the same space. So if we, we have that kind of architecture, you know, we, you know, for mental simulation, you know, we can just run one forward model. And then, so global workspace is updated to the next time step. And then you get a slightly future version. And then you just repeat this many times for mental simulation. So that way, uh, you, know, you can kind of combine these three solutions uh, in, in one architecture. So, but, but probably I need to draw and explain a bit more in detail to make myself clear. Good. I think uh, I think we can end on this one. So we'll pull out a whiteboard on Zoom now, and uh, we can answer more questions or continue discussing. I see that a few people joined already. So in mm -hmm. case people are looking for the link, I will post it right now, and it the chat will disappear on YouTube. Don't be uh, don't be afraid. You can look into uh, the description if you re reload the page on YouTube, mm -hmm. and you'll find us. And uh, yeah, I think uh, I think that's it. Let's uh, uh, yeah, thank you, Ryota, again for uh, for joining us. Uh, so stay with yeah, us for the second sure. part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, for our viewers, uh, we'll have another event uh, soon at the end of the month, actually, uh, and we'll talk mm -hmm. about um, cultural intelligence and maybe a bit about also octopi or sorry octopuses. Um, okay, so. Keep, uh, don't forget to subscribe, not to miss it, and uh, we'll see you soon. Yeah, thank you. And of course, by saying thank you, I should press the button and stream, otherwise that doesn't make sense. Okay, and now we have people on, so 